Thanks. Um, so I like this petition and I just wanna be clear what I see as at stake with this and similar petitions that I invite to go even further. So right now, Cambridge law makes it illegal to build certain types of housing that looks a lot like existing housing. And as I understand this proposal, this would make the new housing that looks like existing housing legal. And so the question as I see it is not just, you know, what would be the best solution going forward for increasing affordability, uh, but also why should existing law continue to forbid people from building housing? And so one of the things that I did when I was reading this proposal was look up the history of why does Cambridge make it illegal to build housing as dense as it currently exists? I had the same question as one of the speakers, um, I think Ms. Sicaccio, about you know, what, what was the reason why we have our existing law in the first place? And as I'm sure all of the you know, other members of the planning board know, and perhaps members of the public don't know, Cambridge's planning board was pretty instrumental in the national history of zoning. And the story of zoning in Cambridge follows the exact same narrative as the history of zoning nationwide. Uh, cities across the country, including in Cambridge, made it illegal to build densely for racist and classist reasons. It was not about public health. It was about this century long disgust of apartments and the people who live in them. Um, and so zoning has always been used to exclude some people from living near others. So, you know, the zoning began in the South. Southern cities attempted to segregate Black people by race explicitly. In 1917, the Supreme Court in Buchanan versus Worley held that racial zoning ordinances were unconstitutional because they deprived property owners of their you know, right to contract. Um, and Richard Rothstein has written extensively. He's had you know, book talks at the Cambridge Public Library and Color of Law about how Buchanan inaugurated a nationwide effort to figure out how do you adopt a race neutral formula that could accomplish the same goals that was just struck down. Uh, the year after Buchanan, uh, at the city planning conference in St. Louis, uh, planners from all over the country, including from Cambridge, discussed how do we comply with Buchanan. Um, and Frederick Law Olmsted, you know, revered public figure here, said that in any housing developments which are to succeed, racial divisions have to be taken into account because people who are not yet ready to mingle and don't want to mingle, uh, if they are forced to live next to each other, then someone has to carry an economic burden. The method of zoning by height and area limitations seems not only to be more likely to be held constitutional by the courts, but it also seems a simpler and more straightforward way of dealing with the problem. And, you know, Olmsted came back to Brookline, um, but in Massachusetts, zoning follows immediately after this conversation. This is not just like this nationwide thing that happened elsewhere. It's very much Cambridge and a Cambridge planning board, this board. So came, uh, Massachusetts had a constitutional convention in 1918, the delegates to the Constitutional Convention included uh, Robert Walcott, a judge from Cambridge. He consulted with this body, the Cambridge Planning Board, uh, and he argued for the amendment that would permit the general court to empower local governments to zone. And his argument was, it is a general tradition or condition which exists in every town where residential property is depreciated greatly by the introductions of uses and people out of place in that locality. And so he told the delegates exactly what you think, it, you know, he would say, like, use your experience. You know how residential districts decay. It does not go to pieces all at once. The first thing that happens is someone who needs the money sells the vacant piece of land. The next thing you know, they put up a grocery store or a drugstore and then a six-story apartment building. And next thing you know, there are realtors trying to drive you out of your town. And so he said, look, you know, the people who are coming in here don't have the same values as you and me. Uh, you are the person who buys a piece of land, you erect a handsome residence, you lay out your gardens until you're driven out by real estate speculators who threaten to build a six flat apartment house next to you. Um, and other delegates at the convention from Cambridge talked about you know, a lot of the comments that I've heard today. Like we admire the splendid residential sections in many towns. While some of us may not be able to live in those sections, we would very much dislike to have people who can do something to injure them. And at the Constitutional Convention in 1918, the response was predictable. It was a response that, hmm, if we allow cities to start restricting where people can build homes, 
it seems like what they're gonna do is engage in segregation. So there was a delegate from Wellesley um, who said, you know, I see a feature in these proposals uh, and it looks very much like the feature I see when I look at the South. And one of the burning issues throughout the South was the segregation of the Negro. And several Southern cities have made this attempt uh, that has been deemed unconstitutional. And to my mind, this is exactly what this proposal would do. It would authorize the limitation of buildings according to their use or density. I should dislike to see it go out to the world that Massachusetts has written into its constitution a clause which would authorize the segregation of a race. Uh, and then other delegates who opposed this also said exactly what happened, that what you're going to see is that in some neighborhoods, people will pay $20 a month in rent, and the next street, people will pay $40 a month in rent, and then in some streets like Brattle Street, you'll see $50,000 houses uh, then which no one can build near. Uh, and then the response was not, you're crazy or you're wrong. It was, we just don't think this is gonna happen. We don't think that segregation is gonna result from allowing cities to zone. And so Massachusetts adopted the constitutional amendment. Cambridge immediately starts proposing a zoning ordinance, uh, debates it from 1920 to 1924. Uh, the debate over the zoning ordinance is why should the city have this power to restrict people from building as densely as they want to build? Why not allow people to live next to one another or where they want to live? And the argument against it is that when apartments come, the people in the apartments injure the people near them, that we need to preserve the character of our neighborhood. Zoning must proceed on the basis of existing conditions. Even the worst sections can be improved somewhat. Some sections may be saved new sections may be protected at the beginning of their development. This is not just a Brattle Street defense, rather we're protecting everybody by you know, making it more difficult for invading outsiders to come in and disrupt our city. Uh, and so Gamebridge passes the zoning ordinance in 1924, the, you know, the thing that we are currently debating whether to amend. Um, the irony is that it gets struck down by the Supreme Court as one of the um, uh, people who spoke today said, the Supreme Court in one case from 1926 said, it's fine to get rid of apartment houses because everyone knows the apartment house is a mere parasite, uh, but it struck down Cambridge's zoning ordinance because it wasn't sufficiently connected to the health, safety, and welfare of the community. Um, and that was Necto versus City of Cambridge in 1928. Uh, and this is a nationwide trend that Cambridge is part of. And it's a trend that does exactly all of the things that, you know, not just Richard Rothstein, but all of my colleagues who study this at Harvard uh, Law School, uh, if you just look at the you know, most recent edition of the Harvard Law Review, all of the articles are about housing. Uh, so my colleague Molly Brady wrote an article turning neighbors into nuisances, which is entirely about how uh, the origin of zoning has this history of this real disgust for apartment buildings and the people who live in them. Uh, Noah Cases uh, has written about how zoning restricts um, you know, women's access to the workplace, because in most families, there's one member of the family who commutes a long distance, one member of the family who generally commutes a shorter distance uh, that tends to be uh, gendered. And so density is really good for lowering the wage gap and having, you know, really undense or uh, uh, restrictions on density can harm the wage gap. Um, you know, some of the speakers mentioned that redlining has nothing to do with zoning, but if you look at the first redlining maps, which is a decade after Cambridge adopts its zoning ordinance, it very much maps onto the zoning map uh, that was originally proposed by this body. Uh, and so you see that on the red areas of the 1930s HLC maps, it's like, uh-oh, this is the area that not only is unrestricted, uh, but it has, you know, an infiltration of Black people or an infiltration of Italians or people who get relief. Uh, and that's why we shouldn't, uh, you know, protect any loans for that area. So, again, nothing that I'm saying here is, is new or unknown. Like, I don't even think anything I'm saying is controversial, but I think it's really worth putting into perspective what we are doing when we're talking about amending the zoning ordinance. We're amending something that is fundamentally flawed. It is fundamentally built on this concept of exclusion. It is fundamentally about saying that we do not want it to be legal for people to build densely because of how that will affect us and what uh, the concentration of outsiders will do to the neighborhood that we have bought property in. Um, you know, so I, I think that it, it's really discouraging to hear comments that just resonate with the Wall Street Journal op-ed that I read last summer, 
in which Donald Trump and Ben Carson wrote, you know, we'll protect America's suburbs. They called the elimination of zoning a radical social engineering project that would compel the construction of high density stack and pack apartment buildings in residential neighborhoods. They could be speaking in Cambridge. And I do not like their politics when it comes to housing because I think it is antithetical to Cambridge's values of inclusion and of welcoming communities of people who don't currently live here, but who want to. So I think the bottom line here is that zoning was created to exclude. It was created to keep people out of Cambridge, it was created to reduce density, and it was created to make it more difficult to build housing that people want to live in. Um, and so I really think that the burden of persuasion here should not be on these, or on this peti or these petitioners. I, I don't think the burden of persuasion is why is this amendment you know, better than any other amendment? I think the burden of persuasion here is why do we continue to make it illegal to build housing? And that's, I think, the real question that this needs to be uh, addressed, because I think that you know, this petition is a step in the right direction, but it's still going to leave a lot of zoning restrictions that I think are really unjustified in the 21st century.